God favors me. God favors me. God favors me. God favors me. If you're able to do so, please stand for the reading of God's word found in the book of Isaiah, the 58th chapter, and we will read just the first verse. Amen. And it reads as follows, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob, their sin. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, I'd like to speak this afternoon. Oh, yeah. I'd like to speak to you from this thought, sound the trumpet. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you now. We acknowledge that you are sovereign, you're God all by yourself. We thank you for life, for health, for strength. We thank you for blessing us to be here right now. You are God. You knew from the foundations of the world who would be sitting here at this appointed time. So we believe that this is a divine appointment where our lives intersect with the words that you will send directly from heaven today. And that those words will fall into the fertile soil of our hearts and minds, give us strength that we need to do the things you have called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Each year during the fall of the year, sometime around October, November, I always began to spend time praying and listening for God to reveal a theme and a scripture to support that theme for the coming year. That theme is intended to serve as the primary guiding focus of the church for the coming year. So we print it on the cover of our programs every Sunday. Our technology ministry projects it on the monitors. But you know, I've come to realize that it is meaningless unless it is written in the hearts of the people. It doesn't mean anything unless it is projected in the way that we live and work and worship together inside the church, and the way that we carry out our lives outside of the church. And more than any time in the nearly 16 years that I've served as pastor, I feel the full weight of the theme, the scripture, the word that God has revealed for this year. As I've wrestled with it during the past few days, it has disturbed me. It has moved me. It has challenged me. It has called me to a place of repentance and surrender. And I believe that it is because we have not just entered into a new year, but we have entered into a new decade. And we cannot go back to where we were. And we cannot stay where we are spiritually if we expect to experience the, what God is preparing to do in us and through us. And so this word has left me with a troubled, restless feeling of dissatisfaction. I'm talking about a head 
shaking, floor walking, foot patting, hand wringing, desire for a deeper, life-changing, far-reaching manifestation of God's power and God's purpose in me and in the life of this church. So I want you to just listen to the prophetic word for 2020 that I believe God has already released that is found in the 58th chapter of the book of Isaiah. And we'll begin at the 8th verse. And it reads as follows. It says, Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. If, if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger. Y'all know what that means. It wasn't me, it was them. You're not talking to me, you're talking to them. It's not my fault, it's their fault. Take away the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. Lord help us. If you extend your soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul. Then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. Talking about transformation. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of streets to dwell in. This is the word of God. And God is commanding us individually in our personal walk and collectively as his church in 2020 to receive the vision of an empowered and purpose-filled church to repair the breaches or the broken places within us, within our relationships, within the work that we do as the church, so that we will be prepared to bring restoration to the community surrounding the church. Our theme, receiving the vision, repairing the breach, and restoring the community in 2020. Since the beginning of time, every person that ever lived or died has had an insatiable desire to understand the world and their place within it. And you know, we get all excited in church when we hear somebody say, God's got a plan for you. And we'll shout all over this church when somebody talks to us about walking into our new year. Our new year, full of purpose, full of power, full of prosperity. Oh, we get all excited. Because, you see, we want the best of everything that has been promised in the Word. But we want to stay comfortable 
and complacent. We want to walk into a new season, but we want to cling to our old ways. We want the glory, but we don't want to give up anything. We want power, but we don't want to have to press through and persevere. We want satisfaction, but we don't want to have to suffer and sacrifice. We want to see sinners saved, but we, want to, we don't want to go where they are. We want our territory to increase, but we won't do the hard work to make it happen. We want the church to grow. But we don't want a new generation to challenge why we're doing what we've been doing. And what we fail to understand is that we will never experience the fullness of what God's plan is for us until we are willing to allow him to do something extreme within us so that he can do something extraordinary through us. If we could just catch a vision of all the possibilities of what God desires to do in our lives individually and as a community of believers in 2020, I wonder what would we be willing to go through in order to experience the full extent of his purpose and his plan. Oh yeah, we love to hear the choir sing, God is preparing me for something I just can't handle right now. They say, oh yeah, he's preparing me because he cares for me. He's maturing me because he cares for me. He's arranging me. He's rearranging me. God is preparing me because he cares for me. But how many of us are truly willing to stand the test, endure the trial, Resist the temptations that will allow God to mature us, to arrange us, to rearrange us, so that we will be prepared to live out what he has planned for us. For to prepare means to do whatever is necessary to be completely ready in advance to finish a job that must be done. So when we make the decision that we're willing to allow God to prepare us, we can be assured that it's not always going to feel good. That's why I heard somebody say, you know, you can't go up unless you know how it feels to be down. You can't come out as pure gold unless you're willing to go through the fire. Huh. You can't even be a new creation unless you know how it feels to be broken. And you sure can't make it to the promised land without going through the wilderness. We are living in a generation where it seems to me that many believers just want to stay snugly and warm in the security of our comfort zone. We don't want to hear anybody get up in church and talk about sin or judgment or heaven or hell. We just want to come to church for an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> drink our flavored coffee. Then get in our brand new car and go on back home. We want to do that rather than wake up and respond to a world out there that is crying out for the people of God to bring some love, bring some peace, bring some hope to those who are in need and bring some salvation and some sanctification and some revival and some restoration to those who are lost. Everything that God wants to do, he wants to do it through his church, not this building. I'm the church. You're the church. God speaks. He commands. He moves through his church. 
The church is not just grandma and grandpa. The church belongs to every generation. Just like the church needs the wisdom, experience, and the dedication of the older generation. We also need the vision, the strength, the energy, the excitement of the younger generation. The church is not just fried chicken and Kool-Aid. The church is at the center of God's plan. And just as God commanded the prophet Isaiah in his generation to cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. God has challenged me this week to speak prophetically to this generation of the church, to sound the trumpet, and to declare that if we are lukewarm about living righteously, it's a sin. If we are lazy, slowful, complacent about prayer, about worship, about the word of God, it's a sin. If we refuse to go to the jail and the hospital to help the hungry and the homeless, to clothe and care for those who are needy, to reach out to the lost, it's a sin. If we come to church every Sunday, but we don't feel the burden to go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature like Jesus commanded us to do. It is a transgression of his word. We want to justify ourselves and say, Pastor, you know, but I don't do nothing wrong. I'm good. <laughs> but James 4 and 17 says, if you know what is right to do, but you do not do it. What did it say? It's sin. We are living in a sin-cursed world. A world that seems many days to be covered by a dark cloud of despair. And church, we cannot remain comfortable sitting inside the church on our comfortable red cushion pews, talking about it, having meetings about it, hoping and wishing that somehow the lost are going to be found, the broken are going to be healed, somehow the captives are going to be set free. Somehow evil's going to be conquered. Somehow the devil going to be defeated. Somehow, let's, let's everybody take a vote. Amen. We got to seize the moment. We got to fall on our faces. We got to fast. We got to pray. Then we got to get up and we got to go. Now is the time. And we have to sound the trumpet today. Bless his name. I could sit down right now, but I'm not done yet. Amen. Just give me a few more minutes. I know, I know all you, amen. Amen. You all and 15 people getting restless. Amen. Amen. Some of you two-hour people getting restless. <laughs> but just, just, just let me do this. You know, because it seems that we're living in a time when, when many people are eager to receive a prophetic word because they want to hear something that make them feel good. And there are many people who claim to have the mantle of a prophet, 
who are willing to do just that. And for that reason, they are welcomed and they are celebrated because they tell people about a future full of prosperity and blessings and houses and cars and lands and favor and all of these things. But that was not the primary purpose of the Old Testament prophets. In fact, 75% of what they were commanded to speak to the people exposed their sin and promised judgment unless they returned to a righteous relationship with God. And for this reason, many of the Old Testament prophets were hated and rejected. In fact, the prophet Isaiah was died when King Manasseh ordered him to be sawn in half. So, with a wooden saw, amen, that really hurt, amen. So when God commanded Isaiah in the first verse to cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins, he must have felt the full burden of what he had to speak. Not only because he knew that it wasn't going to make people happy, but also, when we look at the text, according to verse 2, it is apparent that the people had perfected the practice of appearing to be righteous. For he said in the second verse, he said, Yet they seek me daily and the delight to know my ways. In other words, let's bring it on home down today. They read the daily word every day. Religiously. They're active and busy doing good works. They love going to church and hearing some good singing and some good preaching. He says, there's a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their gods. In other words, to all appearances, they are some right-living, law-abiding, Bible-believing, God-honoring people. And then he says, they ask me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. In other words, they ask me, Lord, what is the right thing to do? They even wear those what would Jesus do bracelets. And they delight in knowing that the Lord is on their side. But when we go into the next verse, into the third verse, the Lord looks beneath their religious practice and reveals that they are not righteous because they are motivated by the wrong spirit. For he says in the third verse, they cry out, why have we fasted, they say, but you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In other words, they are complaining to God because after all the things that they are doing, after all the fasting they have done, it seems like God just won't give them what they want. They even humble themselves. Humble myself. But God didn't elevate me like I wanted to be elevated. So they're crying out and wondering, why are we doing all of this if God ain't going to do what I told him to do? So God speaks to Isaiah, and he says, hold up a minute. Hold up, hold, hold up, hold up a minute. These are my church folks, but they've got this whole religion versus righteousness thing kind of twisted. It's time to blow the trumpet and tell them what I said. So when you look at the fifth verse that is projected here, it says, you know, in other words, you've been fasting, but it wasn't because you heard from me. You're walking around with bad breath because you've been fasting. You're walking around looking like you've been eating lemons because you've been fasting. You're walking around telling everybody about how you're presenting your body as a living sacrifice. He says, but you are not holy and acceptable to the Lord. Why? Because it's all about you and not about what God wants to do through you. Let me break it down a little bit more in case y'all didn't catch it. Well, we come to church every week faithfully so we can check it off our to-do list. Been to church. We read the Bible faithfully so we can argue somebody down in the barbershop. We sing, but it's all about being seen and heard. Sometimes we even preach because it makes us feel self-important. And we fast, but not for the right reason. 
We fast so we can seem deep, more spiritual than everybody else. And we feel justified because what we are doing is right. But God expects so much more from us. He wants us to know today that the purpose of coming to church, reading the Bible, praying, praising, and fasting is so that God can stir something up in you, shake the foundations of your comfortability, prepare us, empower us, move us into a closer relationship with him so he can move us out of this building and into the lives of other people. Hallelujah. So in the sixth verse, he breaks it down. He said, this is the kind of fast I'm talking about. This is the kind of sacrifice I'm talking about. He says to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Let's bring it on home. This is the fast God is calling us to do. If you know that somebody has been falsely imprisoned, fight. Fight against injustice until they are set free. If somebody works for you, treat them with respect. Make sure they get paid a living wage. If someone has been oppressed, rejected, hated, pushed aside, abused, misused because of their past, because of their race, because of their gender or anything else, this is the sacrifice that God wants us to make. He wants us to love them like he loved us until their chains are broken and they are set free. In the seventh verse, he says, it's not to share your bread with the hungry, or that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out when you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. If somebody is hungry, don't preach to them until you give them something to eat. Feed them. They're hungry, feed them. Then you can tell them about the Lord. If somebody is homeless, you do something. You don't have to take them to your house but do something to make sure that the homeless have shelter. If somebody needs clothing, you can show enough, go in your closet. If you don't want to go in your closet, go down to Walmart, do something, do what you can to make sure that they are clothed. And if you got somebody in your family that just look like they just can't get it together, this word lets us know that don't, don't you go around acting like you better than they are or like you don't know who they are. You do what you can to help them because it could have been you because you all came out the same family. If you can't say amen, say So Isaiah cries aloud and lifts up his voice like a trumpet to remind us that after we have had glorious worship, after we have reached heaven with our prayers, after we have buffeted our bodies with fasting, we must become the body of Christ. We are his hands, his feet, his eyes, his ears, his heart. And if we do that, he promised. That if we would just extend our soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul. In other words, he's saying, if you will just extend yourself to those who are hurting, even if you don't have much yourself and you've been struggling, he says, I'm going to do something amazing for you. You will experience God's awesome power that is able to lift the darkness that's been covering your life the depression, the discouragement hanging over your life, once you begin to extend something to someone else, Jesus said, I've already called you. I've already chosen you to be the light of the world, to be the city that sets on the hill. And I, 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 I just I want you to know that when the light comes, the darkness will have to flee. Then he says, the Lord will guide you continually. The Lord will 
order your steps. The Lord will give you wisdom. He'll give you insight. He'll give you inspiration. He'll give you creativity and ideas and revelation. He'll give you direction. The Lord will lead you in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. The Lord will turn every stumbling block that's placed in your way into a stepping stone. The Lord will satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones if, if it feels like you're in a spiritual wasteland and you don't have no joy, no peace, no revelation. The Lord has promised that when you call, he will answer. And when you cry out, he will say, here I am. He will satisfy your mouth with good things so that your youth will be renewed like the eagle. And then he says, you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. You know, just as Jesus promised the Samaritan woman, if you ask him, he will give you living water and you will never thirst again. Because the Bible says it's with joy that we draw water out of the well of our salvation. I want to let somebody know the Lord is preparing to do a new thing in you so that he can do a new thing through you for somebody else. The Lord is able to make a road in the wilderness and even rivers in the desert. And then he says, those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Whenever the command went forth to sound the trumpet, the shofar or the ram's horn, it was done to call the people of God together, not only to worship, but also to hear of the great things that the Lord God was preparing to do in their lives in the lives of their families and in their nation. But when the trumpet was sounded, the people responded because it was also used as a call to go to war against an enemy that had come to steal their blessing, kill their faith, and destroy their future. So the Lord sent me to tell you today that the trumpet is sounding and he's calling the church to rise up and to rebuild the old places, to raise up the foundations of many generations. The trumpet is sounding to declare that in these last days, God is going to pour out his spirit on all generations. And that our sons and our daughters are going to prophesy that our young men will become visionaries, our old men will reclaim their dreams, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The trumpet is sounding, calling the church to walk by faith and not by sight into the highways, in the back alleys, under the bridges, into the gutters, to be repairers of the breach to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up for those who have been wounded, to, to love those who are unlovable, to receive those who have been rejected. The trumpet is sounding, calling us to be restorers of the streets to dwell in, to declare that violence will not be the final word in these streets. Hate will not destroy us. Evil men will not control us. The devil will not defeat us. We are taking back our street. The Lord is calling for somebody with enough faith, enough strength, enough courage to blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm from my holy mountain. And if you are ready for the glory of God to be revealed, if you are ready for the power of God to move in you so that it can move mightily through you, then you better lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion. Because nobody know like you know what the Lord has done for you. Lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion. Because nobody can tell your story like you can tell your story. 
lift up your voice like a trumpet at Zion because nobody knows like you know that Jesus died so that you could live again. That Jesus rose from the dead so that you could walk in victory. Lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion because nobody can walk into the places where you can walk and reach the folks who are just like you used to be. Well, bless his name. Lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion because your life is a living testimony that God still uses broken, messed up, toned down people for his glory if they are willing to just say yes to him. Lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion because nobody know like you know that the Lord is your protector. He is your provider. He is your help. He is your healer. He is the one who gives you some power. He is the one that manifests your purpose. Lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion because there's somebody somewhere who needs to know what you know today, who needs to receive what you've already received. Lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion until the walls that divide us from our brothers and sisters and the walls that block us from the blessings God has for us come tumbling down. Lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion to that blessed day that the Bible speaks of when it says the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and we who are alive and remain we're going to be caught up we're going to be caught up we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air and thereafter we will dwell with the Lord forever forever and ever until that day you ought to lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion. Cry loud. Spare not. Lift up your voice. Because can't nobody, can't nobody, can't nobody, can't nobody do what God has called you to do. It's time to sound the trumpet. The doors of the church are open. If there's anyone here today